Hi, my name is Rosalind Nashashibi. I'm the artist in residence at the National Gallery and um, I, as an artist, I paint and I make films. The films I make are often looking at uh, different collective ways of living or different models for family life or maybe um, how societies and small groups navigate institutions through a personal or subjective viewpoint. And my paintings may feature figures or animals, um, but often from the point of view of the imagination or the language of dreams. Hello everyone, welcome to the National Gallery. My name is Priyash Mystery and I am the Associate Curator for Modern and Contemporary Projects here. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be speaking to you today from Room 30 in amongst our Spanish pictures and in front of this fantastic painting by Giuseppe de Ribera of uh, Jacob and the Flock of Laban. We're here today for the next in our series of Unexpected View Talks with our um, fantastic artist in residence, Rosalind Nashashibi. Now, this talk is very different from our usual uh, talks in the series, um, where we invite an artist working today to come and speak about an artwork in the collection, uh, to explore shared themes and uh, discuss ideas, and perhaps look at the painting again in a different way, in an unexpected view, because today's event uh, is without a live audience. Um, so we hope that you'll be able to enjoy these talks from your own home. Now before I um, introduce today's speaker, um, I would like to thank Hiscox for um, their support of this programme as the National Gallery's contemporary partner. Now uh, Rosalind Nashashibi is our current artist in residence and is occupying the purpose-built studio upstairs at the National Gallery. Um, it's part of a new fantastic um, residency programme that is now in partnership with a different gallery in a different part of the country outside of London. This year's partner for the, for the programme is the Peer Art Centre in Orkney. Um, and Rosalind has been making work over the past few months in response to the collection here at the National Gallery and also um, the collection at the Peer Art Centre. Um, the work will be shown in a display here in this very room, uh, in room 30 at the National Gallery from November this year. Um, so Rosalind uh, is an internationally acclaimed artist who has produced films and paintings. Um, she studied at Sheffield Hallam University and at the Glasgow School of Art and is currently senior lecturer in fine art at Goldsmiths University in London. A Turner Prize nominee in 2017, Rosalind has consistently received international critical acclaim for her films, which combine the everyday with the fantastical, incorporating cinematic narratives while using a painterly style to capture her observations. Her work chronicles intimate moments of contemporary life across diverse circumstances with deeply empathetic and personal approaches. I hope we will be able to touch on some of Rosalind's recent paintings in today's conversation. So thank you, Rosalind, uh, for joining thank us you. today. Um, to start, I wanted to ask you why we came to choose this painting for today's talk. We've, I guess we've looked all over the National Gallery in, in the course of this last year, and um, I kept coming back to Room 30. Um, not, not just because of Ribera, but also the Velasquez here and uh, Zuberan. And the, the f sense, I had the sense that this room was quite important to me in what I was doing now as an artist and the paintings that I was seeing here were, I kept coming back to them in my work. And this one has only come, gone up, back up recently, I think. I mean, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it's very recent. And um, I'm, I've always really enjoyed um, the paintings in this period that quite often f do feature sheep or lambs um, in a religious context. And um, for example, the, it's not here now, but St. John the Baptist by Murillo, which has a young St. John with a little lamb. And this rather beautiful um, 
portrait of Jacob with this, I think it's a lamb, <laughs> a young, yeah, it's definitely young, um, with a very kind of poignant chisel face and this beautiful sheep behind that just looks so kind of blissful. And I just think there's a real tenderness between Jacob's face and the faces of those animals, most of which, well, we lost the, the face of being cut. The painting was cut off that side, so we lost those. But So this is quite interesting for a picture at the National Gallery because it has been cut down so drastically. Um, we, uh, you know, and this has happened over sort of the centuries where actually paintings that were, that were in various kind of royal courts were sort of chopped and adapted to fit certain spaces or to fit certain frames. Um, so we know that this painting was actually much larger. So there's a copy of it that exists still in Madrid um, that was made of the original painting. And actually you see it's, much, it's a much more open painting actually. Yeah, there's a really beautiful sheep having a drink yeah, in so the these... water on that side and other heads of those animals. And you see this open sky and yeah. it's interesting because with this cut down version, I feel the composition has really um, changed and made it much more narrow um, and much more dramatic. So you're focusing more on uh, the figure of Jacob. Yeah. Um, and that's possibly a question I wanted to ask you about the way that you also go through the process of making a painting. So um, later in the conversation, I hope we'll touch on how you approach some of your subjects how you come to paint the figures and the animals that you do. But perhaps first we can talk a little bit about your process of making a painting. So once you have that starting point, you change, I, I feel mm. that you change your painting quite a lot. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's quite similar to the way I make films. Um, there, has, there are a certain set of parameters at the beginning maybe there's a motif that I want to focus on or a composition and or a bracketing kind of element on each side of the painting and then from there I sort of give myself permission to keep uh, moving forward it's like a, a sort of association process from one thing to another quite often so um, I also, I mean, sometimes a painting comes out quite quickly and it is as I planned it and it happens very fast and that's very satisfying for me because I think often in painting there's a moment right at the beginning where the painting looks really great, you know, and you, it's fresh and very dynamic and it, you can't somehow stop at that point and you go beyond it and then you kind of lose that and you keep trying to get back to that. So, but sometimes I'm able to stop and I, the painting is done. Other times goes through many iterations and there's a big struggle in it and then I get to the point where there's almost it can almost be that there's an underneath painting and then a, on top and that I find quite exciting because it's a history to work on that comes through you know either around what I do on top or or gives it a logic that I can mm. follow when I'm painting on top so I quite like that process um, of uh, maybe like doing something on top and then stripping it back so that the original painting mm. comes through and then adding bits so it's kind of putting in and taking away. And I think with the filmmaking, it's similar because when I'm shooting, I'm really open to what's going on around me and I try to be in the moment and uh, shoot the things that I think are important in the moment rather than mm. what I planned necessarily. But then in the editing process, it's a constant kind of molding, putting in things, taking away things, adjusting the perspective and finding what is the key to bring this material together. I mean, I think that's yeah. what editing is, right? So this is the process I enjoy in both media. So perhaps we can then come back to this idea of how you come to paint the subjects that you paint. So um, interestingly about uh, Ribera. Ribera was painting in Naples um, during the 17th century. Um, Naples, and Ribera is Spanish, he migrated to Naples, but Naples was ruled and governed by Spain at that time. Um, so he had a lot of um, patronage through the viceroys and the counts who were in uh, Naples at that time. And it's interesting that he came to paint Jacob um, and the different narratives of Jacob's story from the Genesis in several paintings. Um, there are amazing uh, examples in the Prado 
um, of this uh, of his subjects as well. So it's uh, one thing that we know about Jacob as a biblical figure is that he was almost kind of a trickster. Yeah. Uh, he would sort of dupe his. Uh, there's a there's a painting where he's um, duping his father Isaac into getting his blessing. Um, he's kind of playing tricks on his uncle here, um, who owns the flock of sheep in, um, uh, in this painting where um, he's, he's trying to get as many sheep as he can from the flock of uh, Laban, and it introduces this cunning technique of uh, using these wooden rods, um, stripped back rods from trees to kind of introduce more fleckled sheep into the, into the flock. So he's playing tricks on his uncle uh, as well. And I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the kind of literary figures that you use or um, in your paintings. Well, I mean, I think, I, yeah, just to, you know, address to what you were saying, mm. um, the interesting thing about Jacob as a figure, and I think probably what appealed to Ribera was that, yes, he got everywhere the high level that he got to through deception. Mm. But nonetheless, he was blessed by God, you know, and it was written yeah. that he was the rightful kind of receiving, receiver of these blessings and of all this uh, heights that he got to. So yes, he fooled his father to getting the blessing, should have gone to the older son. And he used this weird sympathetic magic here where he um, put these rods that were kind of light and dark because they were peeled in places into the water where the sheep drank so that then their fleece would grow speckled. Mm. So there's a lot of kind of trickery, yes, and deception, but also this magic around this story. And Ribera himself, I mean, he's um, painted Jacob three times or more, but mm. also painted a lot of paintings of really gruesome kind of violent tortures mm. of martyrs and, and a lot of you know, this kind of age of man, like mm. in the second half of life, but going through agonies. And um, I think he, he himself was also a kind of very cunning man because he, um, along with two other painters in Naples, had a kind of what they called the Cabal of Naples, where they stopped younger yeah. painters who weren't from Naples or, or other masters from other parts of Italy encroaching on what they felt was their territory. So they had a kind of almost mafia type hold mm. on on the region so yeah maybe it appealed to to his own nature cunning nature but also it comes with this idea that um you know he came to paint these uh men you know it's particularly towards the end of their lives the older men um but also as figures who were in poverty you know mm. he, there was this idea of the you know that christian belief of of um of uh, sanctity in poverty or, or being closer to God in, in, in that. Mm. And I think that, um, I think you're right, you know, there, there is an interesting kind of relationship to that, you know. I think also um, he was very good at painting sheep mm. and older men, you know, it was a mm. consistent kind of theme throughout his practice. Mm. Um, and one that I think would have been very popular with his patrons at that yeah. time. Um, so, you in the past you've painted figures like Malvolio yeah. from um, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, um, but also Piero from the Commedia dell'arte as well. I wondered if you could touch on what drew you to those characters, yeah. um, and is that something that was also kind of reflective of the way that you sort of position your work within, you mm. know, in the way that Zuberan was kind of being quite sort of um, strategic about placing his work um, in Naples? Ribera. Oh, Ribera, sorry. <laughs> um, yes. uh, yeah, we're opposite Zuber and Sue. Oh, yes. Connection. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I didn't think about that before. It's an interesting question. I mean, it's quite about a Malvolio question. and yeah. uh, Piero, because I painted the Piero um, from after Votto's Gilles, which is at the Louvre. Mm. And being in this collection so much has made me look at other, you know, collections a lot more as well. And so I was looking a lot at Vato and I wanted to paint the Piero because it is such a kind of um, vulnerable character, the way that, he, that, that uh, Vato paints him. He stood up on a higher level than all the other 
Malcolm Eddard, a lot of figures are in the painting mm. and um, he looks kind of like hung out almost like exposed mm. but also kind of here I am you know this is how it is so it was a very I think it's a very um, sort of yeah sympathetic portrait and equally with the character of Malvolio who's the clown well not he's not the clown but he is a sort of ridiculed character mm. in Twelfth Night he's a sort of petty official who's always trying to kill everyone's joy and then a trick is played on him by the others that to fool him into thinking that the lady Olivia loves him and, and to wear a ridiculous outfit mm. to impress her which of course she hates so he ends up wearing these yellow stockings cross gartered and so I painted focusing on the idea of the yellow cross gartered mm. legs of Malvolio and the kind of painful exposure of that but also this strange it's a sort of beauty in that moment of vulnerability you know that also is in the Piero painting by Votto I think that that it's that moment where you're sort of vulnerable that has that may be painful but there's a certain beauty to it. Mm. But in your painting of um, Piero I feel that you kind of change that character a lot because Piero is traditionally dressed in white you know he's maskless as a clown but very sort of pale he wears white makeup and but your painting of Piero is very bright yeah. you know you use reds and pinks and quite yeah. luminous greens as well yeah so is there a sort of um are you almost kind of changing the character for your painting giving him a bit more kind of presence or um, um, shifting it, you know, through that use of colour and through how he kind of dominates that. You know, I, I, yeah, I think I just painting. really wanted that painting to be red. I didn't really ask myself why. I did a red underpainting mm. first and then I kind of went uh, into this green. It was this really... The way I painted him is with uh, two animals, one on each side of him as a kind of trio and um, there's a, a goat and a and the donkey, which there is a donkey in the Votto painting, mm. um, but it, this is very much Pierre in the middle on these two animals. So it was, a, yeah, it's like um, putting it in another kind of temperature or another uh, mode. I mean, there isn't, I couldn't give you a reason for, for the colors. Well, I, well, maybe I could, but it would take me a bit yeah. longer to think about it. But it's, it's interesting also because with the paintings around, um, you know, for Marvolio, you focus on the legs. Yeah. You know, so you fragment his body. So there's a level of sort of abstraction that you do on these figures. Yeah. They're not necessarily sort of representational as, yeah. you know, Ribera has with Jacob, but the, there's a sort of level of um, playfulness with the paint, mm. Mm. with mm. painting and with the forms and with the colors. Yeah. Um, so I think I wondered if there was anything in that, in the yeah. way that you translate the images into yeah. something a bit more sort of um, uh, a bit simpler in its form. I think I think what happens is that different influences come in from outside but there's also the influence of the paintings I've made before mm. so when I made the Piero painting I'd already done a, f a few paintings of the lower part of legs and feet or ankles in water and the um, so that yeah, ma imagining two legs up to their ankles in water um, and the painting stops around the knee or just before the knee. And I was doing that um, earlier, thinking about being in two states at once, which is something that I've thought about in my films as well, of how to portray an experience where you're not just experiencing it on one level, because that's never the case. I mean, there's, there's several levels in which we experience moments and the one which may be you could capture on camera and the ones that were more to do with your your conscious or your even your unconscious or even some idea of a collective unconscious or different psychic levels in which you could say that you're experiencing something so i use that idea of being half in water and half in the kind of cool air or dry mm. air as a way of trying to think about being in different levels and and also, yes, fragmenting the mm. body through different stages. And so in my Piero is also standing in a sort of liquid. Mm. So in a way, it's coming through from the other paintings. And I'm allowing that when I talk about giving myself permission. It's like allowing that to come through because I, I firmly believe that the thoughts that run, you know, or the kind of visual 
thinking that runs through the painting has a sort of internal logic which mm. is more sophisticated than the one that I could impose on it analytically. So that Piero is coming from the paintings I made before as much as from Watteau and Malvolio's lower legs are coming from those paintings that I made before. Yeah. So I also really started to enjoy this composition of these two kind of like trunk-like lower yeah. legs and that you go, th go through them, you can look through them or you can look at them and look around them and using that as a device for having things behind or, or not behind. I mean, space is also an interesting way of thinking about your works, you know, allowing spaces to um, exist where you can sort of position things within them that might exist sort of in a fictitious way or um, in a totally imagined way. So um, we've talked about the, you know, uh, in the past a few times about the Velasquez painting, you know, uh, the Tela Real, the, the, boar, the painting of the boar hunt, where you have this space in the middle of the canvas. And that's a painting that's also kind of, that's also been very influential in your painting since yeah. you started at the gallery. Yeah. Um, and I feel that also the space between Malvolio's legs also is, exists in a similar way, where it's a sort of stage that you can introduce introduce things into. That's right, yeah. The painting which I'm, I'm looking at, it, that's why my eyes keep going over there, is um, the boar hunt of Tela Real. Um, is, it shows this kind of landscape, but there's a big oval shape that takes up most of the lower half of the painting and above are only trees and sky or hill, distant hills and sky and that, uh, that is an empty space or looks like an empty space. There are small details in it, but it's the canvas that was put down for King Philip to kind of ritually kill, to, to kill the animals that had already been hunted. So it is an arena mm. for this killing to happen. Uh, well, the title's interesting, Tela Real, which means the royal canvas. So the title could be Velasquez referring to the painting itself, and the, but the canvas in, the, the, the royal canvas in this case refers to this canvas that's laid and fenced around to make this arena and I really found that a strange composition um, very weird painting with this ghostly big hollow in the middle of it there are small figures on the very very bottom of the foreground the rest is this ghostly hollow and I thought um, it was like a kind of pool and I have you know I've also I've made several paintings have come out of my thinking about that some with kind of bracketed with these kind of pools in the middle and and also as you say like thinking about the spaces between things and really trying to make not real spaces but potential spaces in the paintings mm. so in that way that they're more connected to um yeah a space for imagine you know for, for for potential let's leave it like that yeah so this is this is you know in one of your paintings you've sort of filled that space with um, you and a friend of yours sleeping, yeah. you know, or um, particularly in Malvolio, between Malvolio's legs, there's a painting now where you've introduced a sort of sprouting, you know, this yeah. sort of green sprouting in, in another painting of those legs, something else has been introduced. So it's, it exists as a, as a, a device almost, yeah. a frame. Yeah, a bracketing, exactly. Yeah. And a, a lot of the, so the, that is the sort of bracketing, that painting there with this shape that I'm describing is kind of bracketing an arena in itself. But there's another painting which has been important in that, which was a Lucello Predella, which is not here, but in Florence, um, where he uses these kind of red balustrades. So, you know, Predella is the long, thin at the bottom of the altar. So he uses these red balustrades to sort of bracket different parts of a story that he mm. tells. And I, I've used that as a device as well. Um, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about um, your, the way that you use animals in your paintings yeah. and how that differs also from when you paint figures? Um, yeah. Because your figures, you know, not only come from literary um, sources, but also from your close network, your close cir uh, circle of your friends, your family. Yeah. 
Um, but animals exist very differently from yeah. that, don't they? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the similar thing is that they're both in this kind of potential space rather than real space when they depict people or animals. But the thing that I love about painting animals, and it's mainly been sheep and goats, but also other um, livestock kind of animals, like bulls and, and cows, is that there's a sense of wholeness to the body of an animal that sometimes through cult for cultural reasons, the human body, particularly the female human body, is fragmented in our perception of it. So the animal head is a kind of whole rather than having a sort of face at the front and head at the back. It's a sort of whole. And, the, and then the whole body is kind of, there's an integrity to it. Whereas, um, Often painting humans is a sense that like all the meaning is located in the face and that's a kind of screen or just like written over that we would read that screen mm. for the meaning in a painting. I mean, mm. this could be a case of that as well. You know, there's very much in, especially now that the paintings you say is being cut, it's like a psychological portrait of Jacob and he's looking up to the heavens. Mm. Um, but the, the animals are there to represent some sort of like really powerful innocence which yeah. i really enjoy as well and this whole room i feel has this sense of um of you know a lot of passion in the painting a lot of yeah. sentiment which sometimes can seem quite sweet but i i find that's interesting that sort of sweetness well the sheep in this painting i feel bring a sort of level of compassion to jacob mm. you know knowing that jacob is this kind of figure who is very um, cunning. You know, Ribera paints him as if he's a sort of compassionate shepherd. Mm. You know, he twists the story and the narrative round, mm. I feel. Um, and it is through this fantastic ability to paint these sheep in such an engaging way. You know, the lamb is looking directly out at us for that reason. Um, but when you paint lambs and sheep, or you know, animals that are livestock rather than sort of pets. Um, you paint them within this space that almost you're not quite sure where or how they're existing. You know, they're, they're kind of decontextualized. Yeah. Um, and they act as almost these sort of mythical figures, I feel. Yeah. Um, there's a, a painting that you've made recently um, of your partner and your son and the third figure within that painting is a sheep, is a ram. Mm. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that work. Well, the sheep, um, so there are these, there's a sleeping turned away figure of a man and a, a small boy at the side, yeah, as you describe, and the sheep is coming in the middle between them in a way, but there's a sort of composition of three heads. And I think um, it was, the sheep is a sort of, in, it is an invasion or interruption in the painting, but it's a sort of softness or protective element coming in as well. Um, and I think when I look at that painting now, I think about the passage between boyhood and manhood mm. more than I think about my relationship to those figures, which is, you know, obviously mm. why I painted them, but, um, and that this kind of element of the non-human coming in, which is nevertheless sentient, it's like, can be enough. Mm that can be enough, like the, the fact that it's non-human gives it a sort of space around it, which is less pressured, you know, it's less like pressure of a, another human face and mm. another will, it's this more kind of silent animal presence, which I find really fascinating. And do you feel that that's a way for you to approach the kind of, the ideas of passion and the ideas of sort of sentiment within this room, you know, that's something that I feel that you've been very drawn to in these paintings. Well, it's a sort of attraction repulsion, right? Because the sentiment in itself pushes you away when you recognise it as sentiment because it feels artificial, it feels like it's forced upon you, that there's mm. this sweetness that is um, not really related to a kind of feeling with integrity. It's a sort of phoniness to that. So it, it's an attraction repulsion, and I find that interesting. It's not it's not just that I, I engage, I look at it and I 
feel emotionally affected by it. No, it's more like I see it, you know, as sentiment, but I'm also engaged with it on another level. So I like that sense of being pulled in and pushed back. Mm. Um, and I want to play with that in, in what I'm working on, I guess. So since you've been in, at the gallery, you've been working a lot on painting and your painting practice. I wondered if you are also thinking about film um, within these spaces and or in relation to aspects of the collection and what that might look like or yeah. what those ideas might be. Well, I am thinking about filming in here, but it's very early days to sort of talk about that and there's various difficulties um, at the moment to think about that, but I would like to you know, um, if I were able, I guess, with the current restrictions on bringing people together, but to bring people into the gallery and to, to play out certain mm. ways of us being together with the paintings as kind of different moments in time in a way. And I've, my last two films have been related to sci-fi and different experiences of time, mm. and linear and less linear time, let's say. Alana, return to the lander. Please. Keep the suit on, Pauline. I'm closing the door. All right. the lander come back to the ship and I thought about being here in, in terms of filmmaking as almost um, the idea of what we how we how we might respond to something how we might mimic it or how it might present a different time experience to the one that we could play out in front of it but they're very kind of early thoughts yeah I feel that's a, a, a good moment to end on in a way okay. because um, or actually to hear um, your thoughts on this idea of approaching a collection that's so iconic and so yeah. historic. And ultimately, it is this dialogue that happens over time. Mm. Um, I guess that's kind of one strategy to think of it as a sort of in the mode of science fiction. But also, how do you feel about it in relationship to um, into the way that you're making paintings, you know, in that dialogue between your painting aesthetic, which is very contemporary, but also something that's very representational. Yeah. You know, you've made, we've talked a little bit about abstraction, but there are yeah. some of your paintings which are highly abstract. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's been, it's nice that, I mean, I haven't been in the studio until very recently because it wasn't built and then there was the lockdown. So it's, it's been a slower process, which has been had its benefits because it's mean it's meant that I've when I was painting in my studio in Islington I was thinking about the paintings here and um, 
I was in relation to them nevertheless, you know, even if I wasn't in the building. And I had this kind of, um, uh, well, it wasn't until the end of the summer that I realized that the kind of representative aspect, which most of the paintings here place a very high um, status on, on things being lifelike, mm. really lifelike, like incredibly so. And so, you know, you could never approach or you would want to, you know, approach this sort of sense where skin and eyeball become so lifelike and there's a beauty and a wonder, um, which is not really relevant to the way that I work. Mm. And so that could sometimes, that was one of the kind of dangers of being artists in residence at the National Gallery is that you, you feel you need to engage in that um, way of painting that you could, that you're not set up for in a mm. way. And that there's, there's at least a hundred years between where this ends and, and my practice begins. Um, so yeah, so that's been interesting. So, okay, that is a pressure. Or, but the, the, the good things about it are very much to do with feeling this, nevertheless, community of a sense that there are so many artists in here and they influence one another and they maybe competed with one another. And that throws me back onto my own experiences and how I been influenced by other artists or influence other or, or compare myself with others. And, and it makes me feel that, um, yeah, in a communion with, with them in a way, even though mm. I can't directly compare my work, you know, in a way that's meaningful. So, so yes, it made me appreciate being able to have, be an artist and have that, have that life, I guess. Brilliant. Um, on that note, um, let's thank you for joining thank us you. today Thanks, and to Rich. having a conversation and another look at um, an unexpected view at uh, Giuseppe de Ribera's painting of Jacob and the Flock of Laban. Um, and thank you for watching at home. Thanks. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more, click on the links below.